All right, good afternoon, everybody. So, Adam Tuttle said he wanted me to make a video about the Satmar communities. So I asked, you know, any particular questions? He said, no, just he's, um, he knows about Breslov and he knows about Chabad. He doesn't really know about Satmar. He'd like to learn about Satmar. So Satmar is very different than those two. On one hand, this calling it a Satmar is a relatively new thing. Um, from really, I guess, from the 20th century, that we have this idea of a, a Satmar Chosid, Satmar Hasidim, Satmar community, as opposed to Chabad and Breslov or some of the older Hasidic communities. Uh, Breslov comes from Ukraine, which is where the Hasidic movement began. Chabad is from Russia. And uh, Satmar is from Hungary. The border, really, of Hungary and Romania. And so my family, for example, they came from there, from, Sa from Satmar, uh, Satumare. And uh, that, that's where my ancestors on one side, my mother's father's family, Schwartz's, they came from. But they came to America, I think, even before the Samarov was Rav in, in, in Satmar. So you have these different aspects of this. The one thing is, in general, the Hungarian Hasidic approach is much more traditionalist and also, in a certain sense, much less what I would say Hasidic. Meaning, the Russian Hasid in particular had an idea that, you know, of a rabbi as being some kind of a, a different type of a rabbi that's totally a different category as opposed to the Hungarian approach and said, alright, so so Hungarian rabbis they, they, especially like the Samar Rav they generally have someone who's a, a Rav of a community, he's a chief rabbi of the community and he might also be a Rosh Hashiva there's an old Indian already, uh, old in Ashkenaz, that if someone was both a Rav and a Rosh Hashiva, he was the chief rabbi of a town, and he was the dean of a, 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 a Talmudic academy, of a seminary, he had the power to bestow blessings. That's what my holy ancestor, the Chavos Yoyer, who at some point in his life, different points in his life, had that those positions, that's somebody who has the power of bracha and, uh, in a traditional sense. This predates the Baal Shem Tov. And essentially the idea of a Rebbe is someone who gives brachas, someone who bestows blessings in a more of a mystical sense. And again, it's, an, it's really an old Ashkenazic tradition that predates the Hasidic movement. However, among the Hasidim, particularly the Russian and the Ukrainian Hasidim, you had an idea that the Rebbe doesn't have to be, uh, you know, a, a, a chief rabbi of a community. He doesn't have to be a Shashiva. He could just be a Rebbe. And, and in Hungary, you did have Rebbes like that. Uh, Shaila Karastir was, uh, was a Rebbe like that, and Rebar Road was a Rebbe like that. Rebar Road uh, was, wasn't even, uh, didn't have any Rebbe Shiyachas, and, and neither did Shaila Karastir. Uh, that's the other thing, is that uh, in general, uh, a Rabbana Shaft, to be a chief rabbi, Generally, dependent on the community, but generally, if someone's son was worthy to be the chief rabbi, uh, he would have 
the first dibs at the job, but it didn't always work that way. It was a traditional thing, um, based on the idea that a king also, man, man, uh, who are the kings or the rabbis? So if you had uh, a king, if his son was worthy to succeed him as king, then he would be the next king. And if he wasn't worthy, then someone else could be the king. And, and essentially that's the idea that we have here. Someone who's the chief rabbi of a town, if his son is worthy to succeed him to be his mamala market, so he would do, he would get the position. However, there were times uh, in different communities where it wasn't necessarily so. So like, for example, the Chavos Yor, his father was a Rav in Verbs, and the community wanted to hire someone else to be the Rav. So they hired somebody else. So he went to Koblenz, he was there for three years, and then they said, you know, we, the, the, uh, the, the, uh, what do they call it? The, uh, well, I'm trying to remember the word now. The contract we had was for three years, and we decided we're going to look for someone else. So then he went back living in Verms, but they didn't take him for a rub. So he was just Ayid sitting and learning there. He was one of the rabbonim of the town, but not the chief rabbi, right? And he just sat there and learned, and, and people sent him to Shilas, and he sent back Truvas, he wrote all this for him. But he wasn't the rub, and then later there was a war, and the people had to leave, and they came back, and eventually for a few years, he was also the rub in Verms, and his life, and a very long life. My answer is the Chavis and that's the type of a typology of what uh, Rabbanim were in, in Germany in those days, in the 1600s. And essentially a lot of those traditions that were the old German traditions were carried when the Jews moved to Hungary. And when the German Jews later went away from some of their traditions, they kept a lot of them, but many of the more mystical traditions that they had for centuries, they abandoned and some other traditions they abandoned, and they became much more modern and cosmopolitan, uh, but still holding on to certain aspects of the liturgy. So then, uh, a lot of those traditions were really only preserved in Hungary. And, and then what eventually happened is that the Hungarian Ashkenazim, a lot of them, for various political reasons, adopted Hasidic traditions without really you know, it wasn't, you know, becoming, like, officially Hasidim, but the, you didn't have this idea of Hasidim and Misnagdim, like you had in Lithuania, that there were those who opposed the Hasidim. It was more or less, uh, you know, uh, that, you know, some people, they had this connection to, to Hasidish Rebbe's. Maybe they changed their Minhogim, maybe they didn't. So, like, the Chassam Sefer, always David Ashkenaz his whole life. But one of his rabbeim was was the Hafla, who was a Hasidish Rebbe in Frankfurt, Germany. And another one of his rabbeim was, was Rav Nassan Adler, who, who also davened with Nusach Hari, uh, even though Nusach Svar, even though uh, he, he, you know, he wasn't really a, a traditional Hasidish. Uh, and there, there was some controversy about that. So you had various Gedoli Israel, they had these in Yonim. And Satmar was more, a little bit more traditionally Hasidic, in a certain sense. Meaning, the Satmar of his family, his father was the Kedushas Yantu, was the Rav and Sigit. His father, meaning Satmar of's grandfather, was the Yitav Lev, was also the Rav and Sigit. His father, Blazer Nissen, was the Rav and Drovish. And his father was the Yismach Moisha, who was the first from that long rabbinical line, the Teitelbaum family that. Uh, he was the one who joined the Hasidic movement. He became a chassid of the Chosim movement, and uh, and then he became a he was a rav already, and he became a rabbi. And that's what we're uh, so meaning traditionally. It was a rabbinical dynasty, and they added on this rebbeish aspect of it. But the truth is, also when we think of like Hasidim with the levush and all that, that was just how the Ashkenazim dressed. 
how Rabbanim dressed. Rabbanim would wear shtreimlach, they would wear kolpikas, they would wear bekishas. It was, it, these are things that predated Hasidism, but what happened was in the other countries, so in Germany the people became more, in Germany the people became more modern and they started to wear short jackets and, 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 um, and fedora hats and so forth. That's why they're called yekas because they should wear the short jackets, yekka like jacket. Uh, but then you have the uh, in Lithuania and in uh, other countries under the Russian Empire for a long time they did wear the traditional clothing until the Tsar made a decree that they couldn't wear a strival, they couldn't wear these traditional clothing anymore. Uh, so some of the Rabbonim, some of the Rebbes still did because they kept to themselves. Uh, didn't go out necessarily, uh, but the common people had to wear non-Jewish clothing. So in part of Poland that was under uh, Russian rule, Congress Poland is called, so they adopted the Spudik, which was really not a Jewish hat. I think it was really Mongolian originally. That it looks similar enough to a Strymo, that became in place of the strimal, whereas other parts of Poland they kept the strimal. Um, uh, but that's why, like in Lubavitch and in Karl and Stolen, a lot of these places, most of the people were not wearing strimal, uh, except in Yushalay. Uh, although now, you know, you live in Borough Park and half of the board, you know, 75% of the people, maybe more, were strimal. So in Karl and Stolen now, more people were strimal than they used to be. Uh, so I think we'll talk more about it. I gotta go. Thank you for watching. God bless. Please like, share, and subscribe. Comment. We'll see you later.